So I'm going to um, share my screen and um, let you know that my ancestors come from England, Ireland, and Scotland. And uh, I honour and think about um, the Tangata Whenua of uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, especially the people in the area that I live in, which is um, Ngāti Toa and Te Atiawa. Um, I live in Wellington, New Zealand, um, and I wear the Te Tiriti of Waitangi as a cloak upon my shoulders to help me to be the best partner I can be. Um, I live in Wellington with my husband. We have three sons. I'm Madeline Taylor, and hi to you all. I'm here today to talk about four things. The first one is about wake, um, being clueless. The second is waking up. The third is understanding. And the fourth is thinking about taking action. And listening uh, to Jessica just now, um, really, um, it was important for us to think about how we can take the steps to take more of the load. But in order for us to be able to do this, we need to go through this process. First of all, being really un um, understanding that, um, that we are being clueless. And I thought I'd start off by telling you a story about my own life. Um, I, I grew up in a um, lovely, loving family. Um, in the Wairarapa, which is just north of Kaitoki, actually, where Jessica comes from, um, north of Wellington here in New Zealand. And um, we used to go on lovely holidays. And in the summertime, we had a, a, a horse. I used to ride my horse to school. There were six kids in my class. Um, when I was 12, I went to boarding school. It was a huge boarding school to me in those days. And it took me about two weeks to be able to find out how to get from my uh, dormitory back to the dining room and vice versa. And then I decided that um, I, at the end of that time, I had no clue about what I wanted to do with my life and my mother got me a job. Then when I decided to go to university, um, my mum helped me to do that. When I finished my university degree, it decided that it was time to go on my great OE. And, um, that was back in 1980, and I uh, came via Australia and left Australia with 10 Australian dollars in my pocket. And I got into London. I was expecting my good friend to come and pick me up, but unfortunately, she was nurse. Uh, she was working, and so I um, changed that 10 Aussie dollars and discovered that it wasn't enough money to be able to get me a, a train fare to go to London, which is where I was going to be staying. What did I do? I burst into tears, went up to a complete stranger, asked them to give me some money to buy a ticket. They did. After my OE, I came back to New Zealand and decided it was time to use my professional degree. And uh, I was living in a gorgeous beachside town and applied for a job as a, um, within a hospital and packed up my whole car and um, put everything into it and drove five hours to go to the job interview. At the end of the interview, they said, now, should we give you this job? When would you like to start? And I said, well, tomorrow would be really great, please, because actually I've got um, all my gear here and this, this is my game plan. Um, they rang me the following day and said, yes, I could start on the following Monday. You know, these things have been happening all my life. Absolute cluelessness, because I haven't realised my privilege such ignorance and utter belief in the world. So it's taken me a long time to wake up, to really wake up. And as a young social worker, I knew that there were people in the world who were less well off than me, but I didn't actually know that the system worked actively against them, against those who weren't part of the privileged few. But as I um, was doing my professional job, yes, that one that I got. Uh, I was involved in a conference in 1986 in Turanga Wai Marae, uh, where the then Māori Queen was living. And it was the beginning of a partnership agreement between the Social Week Association and um, the Māori Rōpū, the Māori group. 
And into the night, um, we talked. And my good colleague, a woman called Hana Tukukino, began to help me open my eyes, even though I'd studied this stuff at university. And of course, what happened, I ended up crying as I discovered this history of ours, really upset and, you know, weeping. And Hannah said to me, Madeline, dry your tears, because actually you haven't really been hurt by the system at all. Your job is to do something about it. So roll on about 14 years later, uh, 2020, and I was at a SIDS conference, Sudden Infant Death Conference in Auckland. And um, I came out one morning and there were a group of Aboriginal women standing in the foyer of this hotel. And I noticed that they were waiting for their white colleagues to come and the colleagues were giving them money. Such a humiliating situation. They ended up talking with some Māori um, women and they went off for the day together. And, and these Māori women said to them, you must, you must stop and talk to your uh, white colleagues about this because you don't want to be doing this. Uh, you know, stand, we, we need you to stand up for yourself. Well, the next morning I was at a payphone because, of course, we didn't have cell phones in those days. And um, I overheard the sobbing and the storytelling that this white Australian woman was telling her colleagues about learning for the first time about the stolen generation. So I was able to go and talk to her about my experience. And, and again, um, like Hannah had taught me, I said to her, you haven't been hurt by this. You need to dry your tears and you need to be taking action and doing something about the situation. So here I am living my life. Um, I've now got four, uh, three children and um, I become involved in the Play Centre um, Early Childhood Organisation here in New Zealand. And we've had lots of tears and lots of discussion about partnership and that conversation is still going on. We're still not there. And I'm still opening my eyes. Last month, I was uh, providing a workshop and I was telling a story about myself being a young woman. And uh, I had a boss who was really taller than me and he irritated me quite a bit because he used to talk over me. And one day I stood up on a chair and he's looking at me and saying, what are you doing, Madeline? I said, you're just over-talking me and it's driving me nuts and I just have such a short amount of time to talk to you. And he said, oh, I'll climb down from the chair and we'll have a conversation. Now, what I realised as I was telling that story is the only consequence for me was that I got what I wanted and that many, many people are not able to have that kind of ability to be able to do that kind of thing to get what they want without negative consequences coming their way. So my privilege goes on and on. And we need to get to understanding. And how am I a part of maintaining the system? By being fragile, by crying, by not knowing our history, by talking and not listening, by taking up space, by hearing the anger and not the message, by thinking I might know better. I think that a lot. These are the ways that we unconsciously support this dominant system and its institutions, those of us who would like to call ourselves ally. And, you know, the system applies to all of us. It's a system that gives me unearned privileges. And as Lila Sehard says, we need to wake up to what is really, really going on. How come I'm like this? White fragility is a process that keeps us at the centre, feeling left out and upset if we're not noticed. Roman D'Angelo talks about it as a state in which, even if a minimal amount of racial stress um, exists, it becomes intolerable for us white people and it triggers a range of defensive reactions. For example, getting angry and defensive, arguing, being afraid that you're being shamed, crying, falling silent, doing something else because this is just too hard, calling the authorities when you believe that you're in danger when in fact you're the one that's going to be dangerous and when you take the victim role. Using micro expressions of racism. So, as I'm talking, what have you noticed about your reactions to what I'm saying? Some of those might be white fragility. So, how do we become so fragile? 
I was brought up with values about knowing my place, not upsetting people, especially in our own homes, and other values that helped me to become a functioning member of our um, Pakia white society. Capitalism was king, and in the last 50 years or so, there has been a harder push towards materialism and individualism and marketing, which is influencing the way that our children are growing up. Mostly, we're not aware of how parents are pushed to feel stink about themselves in order to buy products that they don't need, how they're pushed to please their children. And what this means is that parents unknowingly are raising their children to be overindulged. The pressures on parents today are phenomenal. TV, movies, social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, marketing, school, hopes and dreams, peace and quiet, the housing market. Children who pester, fatigue of parents, the desire to support children to be leaders of their families, to be aware of things that are out way beyond their influence. I saw a clip recently about um, marketing of condoms, and I really want you to spend time when you're looking at, especially free to air TV, the nature of the advertisements that undermine parenting and push children to be the leaders of their family so that parents end up being nagged and it's too hard to stay staunch. So what happens is that it makes it really, really difficult when we grow up to be um, fragile, to be open to conversations about difference and racism. So what do parents actually do to make this happen. There's three things that the research says. The first is that we have soft structure. So we have rules, or actually we don't have rules, but if we do, we don't keep them. The second one is that we do things for our children that they should be doing for themselves to help them to be competent in learning. And the, the last thing that we do is that we buy stuff for children that it is meeting adults' needs, not the needs of the child, even though it appears to be that way. And that might be activities, it's not just stuff. So what do we do? How do we take action? We need to learn about the impact of being overindulged, what white fragility is, and what white supremacy is in our everyday behaviours. And I'm not talking about the rednecks with guns going into crowds with semi-automatic weapons but the small ways that white people maintain dominance by taking up space, by not standing back, by not serving those other Indigenous people well. We need to know our own culture, and yes, we all have one. You need to understand how to build resilience in yourself and in your children. We need to teach our children our histories, the good and the bad. In New Zealand, we need to learn about Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, the partnership that the Crown made with Māori back in the day, and understand the power dynamics of a really abusive relationship, because that's kind of what we've got to. So, I want to talk about four things that um, are important. So, the first one is about learning. The next one is, don't do this stuff on your own connect with others, have conversations that matter, um, create small groups where we can talk about racism and call each other in and out of these conversations. Take the conversations to a different part of your life. Fund these groups who are working in this space and lighten the load of our Indigenous people. And to end, be prepared to go against the values that you might have grown up with about not upsetting your friends and knowing your place. Go on your own journey with it. Start today, keep going, don't stop, keep learning, make mistakes, getting it wrong, but staying strong. Because you know what? When we, became, when we become able to live on this planet with others, and we will be, and we're all connected. And if we didn't know this before 2020, we certainly know it now, how one small virus can bring the world to its knees and how one white system can keep most people bending over. I'm going to end with a poem by a renowned Māori writer 
witty Iheramaya, who has given his permission. It is our watch now, the time to make dreams come true. Today is a good day to begin. Oh, see, proving the point. Thanks for listening and thanks to Pema Queer for inviting me to speak today.